What an honor for Amanda and I to be here this morning and, and to be with Pastors Bob and Dana. And, and uh, it's true, uh, I flew out to Tulsa over 20 years ago and interviewed Bob at a hotel. I was staying in a hotel. He came to the hotel, and over breakfast, we interviewed, and I knew right then this young man was special and got to meet his wife, and we hired, I hired him, I think I hired him on the spot right then, and uh, we've been wonderful friends. I'm going to tell you, I, I've spent the last 40 years around preachers, and that could be a bad thing. And, uh, <laughs> Um, and Bob, Pastors Bob and Dana, integrity is unequaled. And to, to have a pastor who is a man and woman of integrity and character is quite a feat today. And uh, you are blessed. You have the epitome of integrity. All right. And I remember the day that Emma was born. I remember when beautiful Emma was born. And Emma, I love those combat boots you had on this morning. <laughs> I loved them. I loved them. So I am so thrilled about Pastors Bob and Dana being here. And, of course, the kids are dear friends, family friends, and, and we go way back. So uh, good days ahead. I just sense it. Good days ahead for you. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. As you're turning there, I want to tell you about the, this book, uh, Conquering the Chaos in Your Mind. It's been out now, let's see, February, March. This is the end of the second month, and it's already in its third printing. Sid Roth ordered 3,000 of these, and uh, he ordered more of this book. They tell us he ordered more of this book than any guest he's ever had on his TV program. Amanda and I was fortunate enough to be on the program three weeks ago. If you haven't been, if you haven't seen Sid Roth, just YouTube or Google or social media, Sid Roth, and you'll see the interview. And uh, we're just, uh, just amazed at what God's doing uh, with this book. This week alone, we've received uh, contacts from Australia, South Africa, Ka uh, Israel, uh, China, uh, Canada. Uh, this week, uh, I've already pastors have contacted us from New Jersey, Kentucky, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, Oklahoma. Uh, just got a call from Maryland Hickey in Denver, Colorado, and said, we've heard about the book. We've seen the book. Come and minister to us. We know people that are struggling in their thought life. And uh, so we're just so thankful and just kind of humbled uh, if you'd like to get the book, they, we have them out there. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, and most of what I'll be teaching today, portions of that have come from this book. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm just going to quote it from the King James. It's just the one that the, I memorized years ago when I was going through mental hell. And uh, so I just, I love all the other translations. I really love the New Living Translation. I, I love them all. New King, I love them all. I just love them all. But the one that I just memorized back years ago, because back when I was going through this right after the Civil War, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of different translations known to man. All right. For though we walk in the flesh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. Stronghold. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul's talks to the Corinthians. Now Paul talks to the Roman Christians. Now remember, he's talking to Christians here. He's not talking to sinners. He's, he's not talking to heathens. He's not talking to lost people. He's talking to church people, people who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And listen to what he says in, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Let me read this from the New Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God, 
because of all he's done for you let them be a, let your body be a holy and living sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him verse 2 don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let god transform you into a new person by changing the way you what See, I grew up in the Pentecostal tribe. I grew up Pentecostal. And we were taught what to wear and what not to wear. How long our hair was supposed to be and it wasn't supposed to touch our collar in the back and it wasn't supposed to touch the top of our ears. We were taught where to go and where not to go. And we thought that was what made a person holy. But nobody ever taught me what to think. I was taught where to go, where not to go, what to wear, what not to wear, what to do, what not to do. But nobody ever taught me what to think. And this scripture says that if you want real transformation to take place in your life. Remember, who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. You know, it's possible to be saved but still enslaved. And you know a lot of Christians that are saved. They're going to heaven. They've got their ticket punched. Jesus is their Savior, Lord and Savior, and they've been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, but they're still enslaved. They're saved, but they're enslaved. But the problem is they haven't got their minds renewed. They might look good on the outside. They might wear the right thing, and they might go to the right place, but if you don't transform the way you're thinking... Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Our transformation takes place and we're transformed from this world by the way we think. Okay? So this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about your thought life. Did you know that the state of Tennessee, as of, as of last year, the statistics tell us, uh, the State Department of the State of Tennessee tells us, that the state of Tennessee leads the nation in anxiety medication per capita of any state in the union. That per capita, the, the amount of people we have, the percentage of people that are on prescription medication for anxiety is greater than any other state in the United States of America. Anxiety, oppression, depression, panic attacks, racing thoughts, harassing thoughts, tormenting thoughts, the inability to sleep, the inability to rest, the inability to turn our minds off has literally consumed America and consumed the world. And the state of Tennessee, as far as anxiety medication, leads the nation in the percentage of people per capita that are on anxiety medication. And what Amanda and I have learned over the last several years especially, it doesn't make any difference how much money you have. It doesn't make any difference what kind of education you have. It doesn't make any difference of your age. It doesn't make any difference of your race or your gender. It makes no difference of your abilities or your lack of abilities. This thing of the war of the thought life and our minds and anxiety is attacking everybody. It's no respecter of persons. Just last last week I had someone in my office said, pray for me. I can't turn my mind off and they could buy half of the population of the city we're living in because they are wealthy beyond what they can spend. But they can't turn their minds off. At the same, the next day I had somebody in my, their office we had to give them money to buy gas to be able to get back home. And their mind will not turn off. For you see, thought wars are not just for the poor and are not just for the wealthy and it's not just for the old or not just for the young. We all have a mind and Satan operates in the arena of thought. See, our battle is not with people. In fact, if you think that your war is with people, that's where Satan wants you to be deceived and you show up at the wrong battlefield. Listen to what he said again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So our battle is not with people. So if you and I are consumed with having to fight or battle with somebody, an, an unruly uh, peer at work, a crazy relative, does anybody other than Amanda have crazy relatives? <laughs> 
I'm an only child, so I don't have to put up with brothers and sisters. But some, she's got some crazy brothers and sisters. I hope, I'm glad none of them are here this morning. So, our battle is not with relatives. Our battle is not with an employer or employee. For, we, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The battle's right up here. And if Satan can get you and I to focus on other people, as our problem, instead of where the real battlefield is, he will deceive us every time and keep us in bondage. So the battle is right up here in our mind. It's not with people. When we turn our attention on people, we spend our time and effort fighting the wrong battle. We will never win a war if we use all of our equipment and our energy to fight on the wrong battlefield. And the reason many of us allow Satan to defeat us in our family is because we're doing war on the wrong battlefield. Satan operates in the arena of fault. That's his modus operandi. That's his M.O. If he can influence your thought life, he can control your life. Listen, he's never showed up at your house with a red suit and a pitchfork and rung the doorbell and said, I'm the devil, I'm going to tempt you. Or he's never showed up at your house and rung the doorbell and said, I'm the devil, I'm going to depress you. He's never come at you with any showing up in any way other than in your thought. That's how he operates in the arena of thought. That's why it's so important that we understand that we must take control of our thought life. Now, we in the church world, we've done pretty good. You know, we are spirit, we possess a soul, and we live in a body. We're three-part beings. We are spirit, we possess a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in the body. And we, especially in the Pentecostal charismatic tribe, we've done good on two of those three. And those two are our spirit. We know about being born again. We know about asking Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we'll tell people, you need to get saved. You need to get born again. And that's true. That gets you into heaven. But that doesn't get you walking in victory here on earth unless you get your mind renewed with the word of God we get our spirit saved and we've told people now don't go there don't do that and what to do with our bodies it's our soul it's our mind our will and emotions that we've got to bring under control Satan operates in the arena of thought he operates in the arena of thought and here's something I want you to understand your thoughts are blueprints for actions your thoughts are blueprints for actions. In fact, you're here today because you thought about coming. You just didn't wake up today and all of a sudden show up over here without giving it some thought. Amen? Some of you have already thought about where we're going to eat lunch. (laughs) Your thoughts are blueprints for actions. Let me give you scripture for this. Turn with me real quickly to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Here's the verse of scripture that really that set me uh, on the path of understanding. Matthew chapter 15. Jesus is talking. Matthew chapter 15. He says this. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters in the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Now, that, there's no spiritual application to that. That's just what it is. Pizza in, pizza out. Cheeseburger in, cheeseburger out. Anybody tries to give you a spiritual application of that, they are blowing smoke, okay? (laughs) Whatsoever goes in the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated. Now look at verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. Literally Jesus is saying this. He's saying this to people who were so thinking that their righteousness was developed by what they ate and what they didn't eat. Okay, Jesus said, listen, what you put in you, in your mouth, and goes into your stomach physically, will not defile you spiritually. Now, it might not be good for you physically. 
It might not be the most nutritional thing that you need, but spiritually, Jesus is talking spiritually. He says, if you eat a cheeseburger, it's not going to affect you spiritually. If you eat pizza, it's not going to affect you physically. If you eat cabbage, it's going to affect you, but not spiritually. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's going to... So he, say, he says, those things that go into a man in their mouth does not defile you. But then he says in verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, they defile a man. Now look at verse 19. Here's the kicker. For out of the heart proceed, what's these next two foot words? Evil thoughts, thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemies. And then he says, these are the things that defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Now most of us, as you've read the book of Matthew, you've read this chapter, if you've read that book at all. You've read this verse, and most of us just read right over it. For out of the heart proceed murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And we think... That don't have anything to do with me. I'm a Christian. I don't have to worry about adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemy. I don't do those kind of things. But notice the first thing that comes out of the heart. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemy. Now why did Jesus say out of the heart proceed evil thoughts? Because you see, adultery begins with a thought. Murder begins with a thought. Fornication begins with a thought. Before you do any of those things, before anybody commits adultery, before anybody commits murder, before anybody is guilty of fornication or lying or blasphemy or theft, you've got to think about it. It has to go wild in your mind, you see. That's why the Lord Jesus says what defiles you is not what goes in you, it's what comes out of you. And the first thing that comes out of you before you will ever commit one of these major sins is your thought life has gotten out of control. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Satan operates in the arena of thought. And if he can control your thought life, he can control you. I have past, uh, young men say to me all the time, Pastor, I'm tempted, I'm tempted, I'm tempted to be unfaithful to my wife. Or young ladies, I'm tempted to be unfaithful to my husband. What do I need to do about that? I said, you control it in your thought life. If you don't entertain it up here, you never have to worry about acting out out here. Because Satan operates in the arena of thought. That's why he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because that's where Satan attacks every one of us. Let me give you a scripture of it. Turn with me real quickly to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 is one of the most amazing stories, I think, in the whole New Testament. Acts chapter 5. The church had just been birthed in Jerusalem. It was growing at an unprecedented rate. People were coming. Lives were being changed. Um, Money was coming in. Uh, A lot of money was coming in because God was transforming people's lives. And it says in Acts chapter 5 verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back parts of the proceed, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. We're good here. Nothing wrong so far. He, he sold something, and he decides to give some of the money. Nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. That's great. Now, you have to realize up to this point, God had not told him to do that. God had not required him to do that. There was a lot of people in the church giving things to the apostles so that all these people could be ministered to, but there was no dictate from heaven that says, now everybody gets saved. You got to give this much. You got to give, buy something. You got to sell something. You got to make sure the apostles get this and that and the other. None of that is happening. All is happening. 
all that is happening is that this revival is taking place and people are starting to open their pocketbooks and be generous with their resources and give to God. And these couple, Ananias and Sapphira, are watching this take place. And they had a possession, the Bible says, and they sold that possession and they gave a portion of those proceeds from that sale to the apostles to minister to these people that are coming from all over who are getting saved and born again. We're good. Everything's wonderful up to this point. And then it says in verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Now, understand the Apostle Peter here is operating in a word of knowledge. He has a divine revelation of things that you normally do not know in the natural. The Spirit of God had revealed that to him supernaturally. Okay, So all of a sudden, these Ananias and Sapphira, they bring this offering and they give it to the apostles. And Peter says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why did you only give a portion of it? Why have you kept back part of it? All right. And then notice what it says. Verse 4. While it remained, while it was in your possession, while you had this money, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? He's literally saying, listen, if you wanted to keep all the money, you could have done it. I didn't ask you to give this. God hadn't told you that you got to give a certain amount. While it remained, while it was in your possession as a possession, it was yours. When you sold it, it was yours. You could have done anything you wanted to. But then he said, why have you conceived this thing in your heart. Now stop right there. You understand, it was their thought life that got away from them. They would have never failed in this moment had they not conceived that in their mind and it got in their heart. Their thought life got away from them. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. Verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. I'm going to tell you, that's quick. (laughs) That's not the way you do church growth techniques. The Highlands in Birmingham is not teaching this to all their churches. Verse 7, now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. See, they're telling that they sold it only for half the amount that they sold it for. They're They're just lying. Now, they could have said, if she would have said, you know what, we got such and such for it, but we decided to give such and such. That would have been fine. Nothing wrong with that. But they lied. They conceived this thing in their mind and in their heart. And notice what she said, yes, for so much. Then Peter, verse 9, then Peter said to her, How is it that you've agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately, verse 10, she fell down in his feet at his feet and breathed her lies. And the young men came and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Now, our ushers are coming at this time. (laughs) And we're going to take up another offering for the building fund here. Do you understand how this whole scenario played out? It didn't have to end up... These people lost their life simply because they didn't bring their thought life under control. How did they end up lying to the Spirit of God and trying to deceive the church and the apostles? How did that happen? It happened because a thought popped into their mind and they in turn entertained that thought instead of kicking that thought out. Remember what he says, Paul said to the Corinthians? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of 
strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If we don't learn to take our thoughts captive, our thoughts will take us captive. If we do not learn to take our thoughts captive, our thoughts will take us captive. Did you know they tell us, medical science tells us, that the average person processes 60, between 50,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day? The average individual processes between 50,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Now they go on, medical science go on tells us that if you are in the genius category, how many geniuses do we have here? <laughs> if you're in the genius category, you could process as many as 80,000 thoughts a day. But the average person, the average, will process between 50,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Now I know you, th- when I first read that, I read it. I I checked that source several times because I know some people, that's just not possible. I don't think they're using their head for anything. And if you've got a teenager, you understand. You're not processing those 60,000 thoughts a day. The average person processes between 50,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. Did you know there's 86,400 seconds in a day? 86,400 seconds in a day. So if the average person processes between 50 and 60,000 thoughts a day, then every one of us are processing an individual thought every 1.3 seconds. Every 1.3 seconds, we are thinking a thought. Every 1.3 seconds. Now here's the amazing thing about that statistic is that medical science tells us that the average person that between the 50 and the 60,000 thoughts a day that they think, 90% of them are repetitive. 90% of our thoughts are repetitive. So if you're thinking 60,000 thoughts a day and 90% of your thoughts are repetitive, that lets us know that you are thinking in a day 54,000 thoughts of the same theme. Do you see why now a person can go into a FedEx building with a gun and shoot innocent people when they're hearing it 54,000 times a day? Kill 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 those people, 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 kill those people. 54,000 times a day. Do you see why people end up having low self-esteem when they've heard 54,000 times a day, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything, you're ugly, nobody will ever accept you. you. Do you see why people are bound by anxiety and paranoia? Because 54,000 times a day, their mind gets locked in on something unhealthy, unholy, um, impure, negative. See, Satan operates in the arena of thought. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, Over the years, we've heard a lot about spiritual warfare and and we believe in spiritual warfare and it is real. And we've heard a lot about, well, we need to learn to pray and, and bring the spiritual principalities down that are in the heavenlies. And all that is true about the the book of Daniel, about the king, prince of Persia and all the evil principalities in the heavens. We've heard all of that and and that's kind of spectacular and kind of amazing and people like to talk about that. But I want to tell you, the greatest warfare that takes place in your life is not in the heavenlies. It's between your ears. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons. And then he tells us what the warfare is. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, bringing into captivity, taking it prisoner, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Then Paul went on and told the Philippians, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, think on these things. Now, he says Satan's chief goal is to get strongholds built in your life. He wants to get a stronghold developed in your life. Well, what is a stronghold? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is literally a fortress or that which is firm. The word stronghold in the New Testament is referring to a prison. Strongholds are designed to hold prisoners in captivity. Let's get it down to where you and I live. Strong, spiritual strongholds are lies that the devil has ingrained so deeply in your mind and in your belief system that they now exert power over certain areas of your life. Read that again. Spiritual strongholds are lies that the devil has ingrained so deeply in your mind and your belief system that they now exert power over certain areas of your life. When this whole thing started with me in 1980, November of 19, in the late 80s, Satan threw a thought in my mind. And I was pastoring a little church. I was young in the ministry. And Satan put this thought in my mind. You are demon possessed. That thought. I was driving down the road. Pow. You are demon possessed. And I'm pastor of the church. And people say. People say. Why would you think such crazy stuff like that? Well let me ask you a question. Why do you think some of the crazy stuff you think? Some of you have been believing some stuff about yourself that is absolutely untrue. You've formed opinions about yourself and your welfare and your self-esteem that are totally unfounded. But that thought popped in your mind and it has become a part of your thought pattern and belief system. Now it is the filter through which you see life. Spiritual strongholds are lies that the devil has ingrained so deeply in your mind, in your belief system, that they now exert power over certain areas of your life. And the person who lives, behind, lives life behind mental and emotional bars, viewing life through that illusion of bondage. <laughs> Can I come down here? I, I don't... I'm short, so if, you, if you're watching me by camera, I'm not disappearing. <laughs> I didn't know this. I grew up in church. My granddad was the pastor. My grandmother was the women's ministry director. My mama was the organist. My dad was the deacon. They tell me the first place they took me from the hospital when I was born after I went home the very first place they took me was the church house I went Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night Thursday night prayer meeting Friday night youth service our church was only 50 people I was the youth (laughs) on youth CA day used to call them CAs in the Assemblies of God on CA day they'd have CA day and the CAs had the service I was the youth So I preached, I sang, I took up the offering, I gave the altar call and responded to the altar call. (laughs) I was it. I grew up in the church house. I knew where to go and where not to go. 
what to wear and what not to wear. But nobody taught me what to think. And I, I grew up always wanting the subtleties of God. See, if you grow up in the Pentecostal charismatic tribe like I did, you're always looking for the suddenlies of God. We love the suddenlies. Acts chapter 2. And suddenly, there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where there was sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon all of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Have you ever read that? Acts chapter 2. That's our banner scripture. But you notice it happened suddenly. Acts chapter 9. Paul's on the road to Damascus and suddenly a light shined from heaven. Paul is drastically transformed, but it happens suddenly. We love the suddenlies of God. We, we pray for the suddenlies of God. We, we love it when we lay hands on somebody and they're suddenly healed. Or, or we love it when we pray for something and it suddenly comes to pass. The, it the suddenlies are wonderful and we anticipate them. But do you realize the suddenlies are the exception in the Bible and not the rule? They're the exception and not the rule. Yes, we want them to happen. We look forward to it happening. But wonder if it doesn't happen suddenly. Then what do we do? Do we give up? The suddenlies are the exception and not the rule. God's kingdom operates by process, not the suddenlies. And this is why a lot of Christians get discouraged. It's because they are looking for the suddenlies, and when the suddenly don't happen for them, then they get discouraged and weary and they give up, not realizing that they're right in the middle of the process of God's kingdom taking place. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you remember over there in Mark chapter 4, Jesus is teaching in Mark chapter 4. And the whole chapter in Mark chapter 4 is about the sower and the seed. You remember that? The sower went out to sow and he sowed some on the rocky ground, sowed some on the good ground, he sowed some on the dry ground. But then you get over there about verse number 26, it says this. Then Jesus says, so is the kingdom of God. Everybody say kingdom of God. Okay, now, here's, he's getting ready to tell us how God's kingdom operates in your life and my life. So is the kingdom of God. If, if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up, he knows not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. Now remember what he's talking about? He's talking about the kingdom of God. He says, here's how the kingdom of God works. You plant seed, and then over time, that seed, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And then when it finally, the full corn comes forth, then you have the harvest. Notice he didn't say, this is how the kingdom operates. You plant seed, tomorrow you get harvest. He didn't say, you pray today, and tomorrow it's automatically done. Those are the suddenlies. If it happens, wonderful. But that's, not how it, that's the exception, not the rule. The rule is, you plant seed, first the ear, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Amanda and I had just moved to All Good years ago in our little church, and they didn't have much money. We didn't have any money, and uh, we decided we was going to have a garden spot. Now, I'd never had a garden in my life, but we decided we wanted to eat. So uh, we went to the co-op, and we got some tomato slips, and we got some beans, and we got some potatoes, and we, and we got some okra. And we had a guy come over, a neighbor come over, and till up a little spot, no bigger than the front of this right here, and tilled up a spot. And we was going to plant this, this stuff. 
So it was a Friday. I still remember it was a Friday. And we had it tilled up and we planted our okra and our tomato slips and our beans and our potatoes. We plant, And then at the end of the day when we planted, we held hands and we stretched our hand out. God bless this. Be fruitful and multiply in Jesus' name. You said you'd bless our, our field. You said all that. And we prayed over that. It was a Friday at night. We went inside and went to bed thinking, glory to God. We've done. We're going to have food to eat for the winter. <laughs> the next morning, Saturday morning, I woke up bright and early. Sun was coming through. I, walked, I got up to go to the restroom and I looked out the back window and something caught my attention. There in my garden spot was, I, I took a double take. I went to the window. It looked to be full cantaloupe, full watermelon, corn in my garden. I woke up and I said, Amanda, Amanda, get up, get up, get up. She said, what, what? I said, a miracle has taken place. She said, what are you talking? I said, there's stuff in our garden. God heard our prayer. I got my clothes on real quick. She, I heard her laughing. She knew something was up, but I was caught up in it. I ran outside, and I was thinking, man, the prayer of faith. <laughs> this is going to be a story. This will build my church right here. This right here. I've got garden-growing faiths, what I got and then the closer I got to our little garden spot, I saw footprints around <laughs> our garden. And it dawned on me that some of our friends had during the night snuck in and put cantaloupe in the garden, <laughs> watermelon and corn. And by the time Amanda got out there, she was laughing, I'm laughing. And you know, you think about it. You don't plant a garden spot on Friday and reap a harvest on Saturday. And what kind of farmer plants okra and gets cantaloupe? <laughs> I didn't plant any cantaloupe or no watermelon. But see, the kingdom of God operates by process. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. You say, what does this have to do with strongholds? Well, here you remember this. Satan is not a creative being. He can't come up with anything new. He is a dummy. We give him too much credit. He just took God's kingdom process and turned it. How does a person get a stronghold in their life? First the thought, then the imagination, <laughs> then it becomes a strong. First the thought. A young couple sat in my office and they couldn't believe it. The wife had been unfaithful. They were members of the church. They loved God. Had beautiful children, very successful. She had been unfaithful and she buried her head in her hands. Oh, pastor, why did I do this? Why did I do this? I can't believe I did this. What happened? What happened? And I said, chances are at the break room he probably just told you you look good her mouth fell open she said they tell you they tell you I said no I said but that's how the devil works just introducing a thought and you didn't take that thought captive you entertained that thought you dwelled on that thought and then it turned into an imagination What's an imagination? The word imagination comes from the word image. It's just a picture of the thought. How many times has somebody made you mad and you thought, well, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. And before the day's out, you've already pictured in your mind yourself talking to them and what you're going to say to them. See, it moves from a thought to an imagination. And then if you... Do not bring that imagination down, casting down imagination. Then it becomes a stronghold. It becomes a belief system. It becomes so forceful in you that you've got to act on it. You have to act on it. 
That's why it's so important that we just learn to take every thought captive. Every thought captive. And that thought got in my mind. You're demon possessed. And I didn't know what I'm teaching you this morning. And I dwelt on that thought. And that thought went over and over in my mind. And it grabbed me. And within three months, I got to the point I wouldn't get out of my house. I lived in paranoia and torment and fear because I was demon possessed. And mercifully, the Lord appeared to me and showed me some things and taught me what I'm teaching you this morning. And it wasn't the visitation of the Lord that set me free. It was getting my mind renewed with the Word of God that set me free. Because He didn't promise us that He would visit us with a vision. But He did promise us that His Word would work if we'll work the Word. Stand with me, would you? If you're tormented in your mind, I... uh, Amanda and I, uh, I, I Amanda's going to go back to the book table, but I'd, I'd like to pray with you. I'm going to turn the service back over to Pastor here in just a second. But as soon as he gets finished, uh, I'm going to be up here around the front. And if I could just have some, maybe some ushers help me here. Uh, if you're tormenting in your mind, here's what's going to happen. Um, I went to heaven uh, several years ago and and the Lord told me that my ministry would take this shift just like it has. I mean, it's unbelievable. And the Lord says, you teach on the thought life and you pray for people because people that are, they're going to be disabled if you don't. So what we're finding everywhere we go, people are lining up for us to pray for them because they're tormented in their minds, racing thoughts, anxious thoughts, anxiety, panic, depression fear, whatever it might be. They can't get peace up here. And here's what happens. When I pray for people, there is a temporary peace that comes on them because there's an anointing. But you've got to get your mind renewed from that day forward. You've got to change your thoughts. And uh, I talk about that in the book, a simple way to do that, that the Lord showed me. So if you want prayer, as soon as pastor gets finished, I'll be up here and I'll pray. And what's happened, a temporary peace will come on you. But then you've got a responsibility then to get your mind renewed with the Word of God. And it's little by little. Getting our minds renewed is not a one-time event. It's a daily exercise. Okay? Every day. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Bless the people. There's some people here this morning that their minds have been running wild. And I'm asking as we pray for them that the anointing will break that spirit of harassment. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, I'm going to go ahead and let you stay there real quick because we're going to do a little bit different. I know that there are those in the room that need ministry. And if that's you, go ahead and come on forward right now. You're just dealing with things in your mind right now. There are things that are going on that you just can't shut off or turn off. I want you to come forward right now. I was going to take an offering right now, but I'm not going to do it. I think ministry has to take priority right now. So right now, come forward. If you're dealing with fear, you're dealing with anxiety, you're dealing with doubt, you're dealing with turmoil, you're dealing with a history of something that happened years ago, I want you to come forward right now. Don't don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Maybe you were hurt by someone. Maybe and, and the devil has just begun to lie to you. Teenagers, young people. Maybe it's maybe it's self-image. Whatever that might be, I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. Don't be afraid. This is not a moment that you want to let go. I really believe that God wants to do something in your life right now. One of the best teachers I've ever heard was this gentleman right now about the subject of the thought life in the mind. 
Don't leave here the same. Don't leave here the same. Close your eyes. Just reach your hands toward these folks and begin to pray for them. As he prays, just by faith, begin to receive with them all that God wants to do. Hallelujah. 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 It's okay. Just begin to pray for the folks that are coming forward. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we just thank you. As you get ready to leave this morning, we've all received something today. The Bible says that we're supposed to take care of those that are traveling ministers, and I'm going to have my ushers at the back door. We want to give Pastor Eddie an offering, and rather than take more time to pass a, bu to pass a bucket and do those kinds of things, I'm going to have my ushers at the back door. Guys, are you okay? Everybody all right with that? And as you leave to make way for our second service, I want to I wanna challenge you guys to do your very best. As we send pastor out, the Bible says this. It says, dear friend, you're doing a good work when you take care of a traveling teacher. You do well to send them on their way in a manner that pleases God. So we ourselves should support them so that we may become partners with them in the truth. As you get ready to go, this message that now is going global, I believe as we partner with Pastor Eddie and sowing into a brand new ministry that he stepped into a month ago, 
He's been a pastor for many, many years. And when we sow into his ministry, we become participants in that ministry everywhere he goes. It's not about your money. It's about the lives that can be impacted, touched, changed, and transformed because of our willingness to send forth the minister. So I want you to do that for me. I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to dismiss you. I want to thank you so much for being here online. Thank you for being with us this morning. We are so excited that you've joined us today. If you know somebody that can be here in the next, oh, 15, 20 minutes, pastor is going to be ministering this same message again. But let's just pray right now and believe for this offering to be a miracle. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And as we close this ministry moment out, there were those that came forward, Heavenly Father, to receive from you. And I believe some of them did experience suddenly, but some of them, Heavenly Father, began the process of releasing those strongholds, about casting down those imaginations. I pray, Heavenly Father, right now that as we, as we get ready to receive an offering for this traveling minister, I believe, Heavenly Father, that you want it to be a blessing because there are those that are held in bondage. There are those that are consumed in their mind and cannot control their thoughts. And God, we want to participate in this ministry to set the captive free. So, Father, we pray right now a blessing, a supernatural blessing upon this offering. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gift of Pastor Eddie and Miss Amanda. We ask, Heavenly Father, that all they do, we become partakers in what they do. We thank you for it now. Now, God, as we go our separate ways and do our different things, Heavenly Father, we pray that the angels of heaven would be encamped around about us, that you'd watch over us and protect us. Father, that whatever we put our hand to this week, Heavenly Father, bring increase and prosperity to it. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would walk in your divine health and healing, that our minds would be secure, and we would know, Heavenly Father, that greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. Father, we thank you for it now. We receive all your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church, as you get ready to go. Have a great day. Make sure you greet someone. Don't forget, the offering will be at the back door as you walk out the room.